Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's Aviation Week Ask the Expert webinar, why thermal bypass and thermostatic control are critical in A&D applications, sponsored by Thermomega Tech. I'm David Hambling, Defence Specialist, and I'll be moderating today's event. There are a couple of announcements before we begin. Firstly, this webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn about today's speakers, download resources, share this webinar via social media outlets, and participate in the Q&A session that takes place at the end of our presentation. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. Toward the end of our webinar, we'll ask you to complete our survey found on the right-hand side of your screen. Please take a minute to fill this out before leaving us today, as your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. Lastly, if you experience any technical problems, just click the Help widget at the bottom of your screen, or type your issue into the Q&A area, and we'll be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. Now, on to the presentation, why thermal bypass and thermostatic control are critical in A&D applications. Discussing today's topic is Glenn Quinty, Senior Design Engineer at Thermomega Tech. Glenn develops innovative thermostatic solutions for the aerospace and defense, industrial, railroad, and commercial. With expertise in complex design mechanisms and new product development from start to finish, utilizing DFM and DFA techniques to design thermostatic self-operating valves and devices. So, Glenn, come a very basic question. What are thermostatic valves? Uh, so, to start from the beginning, I just pulled up a generic uh, a Googled response for thermostatic valves, and you'll see it says it's a, a device that automatically responds to temperature changes and self-adjusts to achieve and or maintain a desired temperature for a process or equipment. So that's very, very general. So right below, I have a couple of uh, sp uh, specific examples. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see diverting mode cold, and what that is is where the process fluid will come in through the bottom and exit to the left. Uh, and in the same valve in the center portion, the di diverting mode hot comes in through the bottom and diverts to the right. That, that same valve can also be used to as a mixing valve where you have the warm temperature coming in from the left, the cold temperature coming in from the right, and what mixed to a desired output. So the heart of all of the, uh, that valve I just showed you is uh, the thermal actuators. Uh, they're the controlling element within a system that senses ambient or fluent temperatures to convert thermal energy into mechanical motion. They were invented around the 1930s. The uh, wax fill element was first used in automotive and engineering and en engine cooling systems and has branched out into a variety of different applications such as heating, ap heating systems, plumbing systems like your hot water research, uh, industrial equipment and, and systems, and is now finding uh, a lot of applications in aerospace and defense. And just to the right, I just showed an example of a couple of actuators that we have there. You can see they vary in size. So the smallest one is the one in brass, the old gold-colored one on the left. That's probably about uh, five-eighth inches diameter by maybe one inch long, and can handle a load of about uh, 30 pounds. The one in the middle, that's uh, about uh, seven-eighths in diameter by two inches long, and has a force output of about 150 pounds. The phase change technology, so this is basically, if the actuator is the heart of it all, this phase change technology is the heart of the actuator. How it operates, it utilizes a proprietary blend of paraffin wax that changes in volume as a response to temperature, uh, changing from a solid to a liquid and then back from a liquid to a solid. Uh, various waxes can be utilized the phase change within a specific temperature range uh, to meet uh, any application requirements. And then in the picture on the right here, you'll see the cold position where the wax in a solid state. So the wax representing the blue uh, and the piston, as you can see, on, it is, is retracted. Now as it's heated up into its active range, the, uh, uh, the paraffin wax will then go through its active range and expand between 14 to 18 percent which we take advantage of that by uh, transfer, transferring that into a stroke. And you see the piston extended out. And typical stroke ranges, depending on the actuators selected, are around 0.1, uh, 
uh, 100 thousandths up to about a half of an inch. And this is a typical actuator curve. So for that stroke that you just saw between 0.1 to 0.5 inches, uh, this is how it's, this is how the actual uh, theory that goes behind all uh, paraffin actuators. So starting, starting at the lower left end there at 150 degrees and a position of zero, you'll see, and if you follow the bottom line uh, as you go to the right, uh, you'll see it start to uh, uh, slope upwards, but at a very linear fashion. As you can see right above that, it says thermal linear expansion. That means it's not in its active region yet. Uh, and you see that very first point at the lower right-hand side where it says uh, start of phase change. That's about when the stroke versus temperature curve reaches about a 45-degree angle. And this is where the, what we call the active region starts to take place. And you'll see from there the slope keeps increasing until it reaches its termination point, which is what we call the upper knee on, the, uh, on rising temperature. And, it, what, and what it's doing there is dynamically going from its solid state into its full liquid state. And at the very top there, you'll see that it's that, that knee will now bend to the right and go off into that thermal, thermal linear expansion again. And what that is, is it, that's an identical thermal linear, linear expansion of about a thousandth of, of an inch per degree F, same thing as where it started in the cold region. So when it's outside the active regions uh, of, of the uh, uh, expansion range, it, it, uh, it reverts back to very, just standard thermal linear uh, expansion, not only for the actuator, but for whatever valve it's mounted into. Now, on the way back down, starting at the 220 on the top line, as it starts moving from the upper right towards the, the left, uh, uh, left-hand side, you'll see it start, you hit your first knee on the downward side where it's in the blue, where it says start phase change, liquid to solid. Now it's actually transforming right back into its solid state Again, decreasing in temperature uh, all the way down to where it goes back into the thermal linear range back towards the right there. And if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see position in inches. So it started out at roughly zero, and over that 150 to 220 degree band, it reached about almost 255,000 or so. Um, and the purple range is called the hysteresis band. And what that is, is and that's typical and inherent in all paraffin uh, style actuators and the, and the fact that uh, because there's usually a biasing force spring operating inside a valve and you need some type of retraction force uh, uh, pressure on it, it takes more thermal energy to, uh, to be able to, uh, to have the actuator stroke out, which is why, as you'll see, there's a little bit of a, a like at the two, 210 mark on the uh, temperature line, if you follow that up to where the lower line hits. Um, if you then uh, hold that and, 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 and drop the temperature to 209, 208, the curve's going to just stay the same. It's kind of a deadpan, and the actuator will not move its position until it reaches, on, in this particular case, down around 207, 208, something like that. And then it'll uh, trace, or, or uh, it, will, it will actually retrace that curve back down again as the uh, temperature starts to drop again. So that's one thing to uh, uh, keep in mind and, and take note of. Um, so uh, one of the, well, actually two of the valves that we have that we use them, they're considered modulating valves because what they do is they sit there and they monitor systems. So, and we have a diverse, uh, direct acting and a uh, reverse acting. So in direct acting, what we're doing is taking that thermal actuator, building it into a valve, an inline valve, and for the direct acting, it opens on falling temperature. So an example would be a freeze protection. So in other words, you would take um, a wax that uh, has an active region at around 35F. And of course, um, we all know uh, water freezes around 32F, so we look at maybe three or four degrees above, you, uh, which is where you want to be. So at room temperature, this actuator would be expanded out, and that plug that you see would be up into that uh, O-ring, right at the right-hand side there, uh, closing it off. Now, as the temperature falls from room temperature down to around 35, 34, that's now you're into the active region of the wax. That pellet, which, which was, uh, which was uh, fully liquid, is now starting to uh, transform from liquid back into its solid phase. 
And uh, when it does that, hence it retracts the piston, which retracts the plug, which opens it up and allows warm water to pass through. As that warmer water passes through, again, there's a little bit of a, a hysteresis band there. So for a 35 degree actuator, you have to hit about 40 or 42 F, maybe, maybe five to seven degrees higher before it'll start to turn around and uh, start to expand back out again and close that port off again. So if, if, if you can imagine, uh, it's almost like having a person standing there uh, with just with a regular quarter turn ball valve and they're watching a thermometer and they're uh, constantly 24 seven, 365 days a year, they would be sitting there watching this thermometer. When it drops to 35, they would open this valve, wait for the uh, resupply, the warmer resupply water to come in. When it hits 42, it, it would manually shut it off again. In the reverse acting, uh, what we do is, and the reason we call it reverse acting is because you notice that on the lower right-hand side it says lollipop head. If you notice that head, the uh, that that plug is on the opposite side of that sealing O-ring uh, uh, compared to the aforementioned direct acting one. So that's why we call it reverse acting because what that does is that one opens on temperature rise, not on temperature fall. So while the first one's trying to keep things warm. This reverse acting is doing the opposite, trying to keep things cool. So at room, it's, uh, let's say, for example, uh, for a, uh, a, a skull protection valve at 110F, we'll say, if it's sitting at room temperature, the valve is closed. As the temperature rises and it senses something up around 105, 106, something like that, the wax is going to start to change phase, and it will then um, expand in volume between 14 to 18 percent and uh, it will then uh, transmit the motion out of the piston and it's opening the plug and allowing that uh, the hotter water out, waiting for cooler water to come back in and uh, have the actuator uh, cup sense that and the wax uh, transform back from the uh, liquid and back into a uh, solid. Right. Okay, so that, that tells us a bit about what they are and what the different types are. Uh, can you tell us what the advantages are uh, of using self-powered devices for this type of application? Sure, let me just move to the next slide here. So the advantage of thermostatic valves are, and one of the, the biggest advantages is they're self-powered. They require no auxiliary power above any kind. Um, they can be located virtually anywhere oriented in any position, no extra wiring, anything like that. There's actually no electric power required, ideal for um, explosion-proof and, and spark-free um, environments. Uh, used as a main source or backup for fail-safe. Uh, they're maintenance-free, they're uh, maintenance-free, sorry. They're very um, predictable, <clears throat> excuse me, very uh, simplistic in design, as you saw from the previous page, there's only about four uh, components in, in, to the whole valve. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And the actuator component has a high power to size and weight ratio, optimizing the valve performance, resulting in a compact size. And I believe that falls into um, the uh, low swap uh, SWAP size, weight, and uh, power device uh, uh, category. Yeah. yeah. So and and so, um, like, like I said before, so the are that. A larger actuator that I showed in, in the previous example, that uh, it's a, uh, about seven eighths diameter, about two inches long, weighs less than a, um, a McDonald's quarter pounder, but it can lift 150 pound force. So that's a very advantageous. Yeah, so that's a fairly good summary of the advantages. Um, in what types of applications could you use thermostatic control valves, in particularly in the aerospace and defense field? Okay. So uh, predominantly, it's like mixing and diverting uh, valve applications. Uh, these valves are used to proportion uh, flow and response to fluid temperature variations in both mixing and diverting applications. So as you see in the first slide, first uh, on the left-hand side, in the diverting mode, it comes in through a common port, past the sensing actuator element there, and depending on the temperature on the upper one, if it's too hot, there's a spool in there that modulates down to close off one side of the seat. So anything that's hotter than the uh, uh, nominal temperature, it, it will divert it upwards. When it's cooler than that, the spool modulates backwards. 
because the wax is retracting and, and the uh, piston is also uh, retracting, and then the, the flow is diverted downward. Uh, in the center uh, example there, you have flow coming in from uh, both sides, one hot, one cold, and as it's mixed, it again goes across the uh, thermal element, and depending on the temperature that the thermal element senses, it'll modulate the spool back and forth, uh, uh, proportioning the spacing between the cold and hot ports to, get the, to try and get the uh, desired temperature. Uh, on the far right, that's a thermal bypass valve. It's sort of like the first example that I showed diverting. The only difference there is this one was specially made for a certain customer uh, for a, a mobile defense vehicle, and it was using a hydraulic circuit that was up around 7,000 PSI that it had to see, um, and they wanted a uh, insertable and hence removable cartridge-style uh, element in there. So what you'll see in the, in, the, in the top picture, when the unit is cold, they want to have as rapid of a uh, warm-up as possible so that it would just circulate from the sump up through this manifold valve and right back to the sump again, up through the engine. Uh, and when it's up to temperature, our valve, uh, the valve will then cut that port off and have it pass, go up and pass through the radiator or heat exchanger. Another uh, application for uh, thermal bypass valves for, is for hydraulic systems. So hydraulic systems need to maintain a specific temperature range for systems to operate efficiently. So uh, for the bullet points below, if it's too cold, it increases fluid viscosity. You have a high stress on the system components. If it's too hot, reduces the fluid viscosity, internal leakage, you have possible uh, pump cavitation, and possible component failures such as O-rings and things like that that can't uh, take that kind of heat. And where this works into here is, it's, if you've ever seen like a pump efficiency curves, since you're not pumping like water, which really doesn't uh, change in viscosity over temperature, most of the VG oils, um, uh, that by say a, a VG43 or something like that, 42, any of those uh, that change viscosity with, ch with uh, temperature, you're going to have a, a constant uh, struggle between the volumetric efficiency and mechanical efficiency. So when it's too cold, you're going to have a very high mechanical efficiency for the pump being able to pump it, but a very low volumetric e efficiency because the fluid is too viscous. Um, and conversely, when it's too hot, now the, the, the two flip around, your uh, mechanical efficiency is too low, or your volumetric efficiency is, is very high. So there is, as, as you can quite imagine, there are two curves that kind of fight each other as they come off of the uh, efficiency versus viscosity uh, and, and temperature range. But where, they, where the two cross paths, that will be the ideal point, and there's usually a, um, optimal, op, an optimal uh, temperature range for which uh, certain uh, uh, VG oils would, would want to be pumped at. So on the example on the right here, what you'll see is a sump. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll heat the sump to get it up around, let's say, a nominal 40 degrees C, maybe 104 F. That seems to be about normal for like a, a VG40 uh, hydraulic oil to have it pumped at its most efficient point. So from the sump, it goes over to the pump. So it, it, uh, uh, we'll uh, take the example of having it start out cold. So if it's starting out cold, the sump is now trying to warm up, but the, the fluid's cold. It's going to go to the pump, go up through the circuit, and hits our uh, uh, mixing uh, our diverting valve there. Once it goes into the diverting valve, the thermal element's going to sense that it's too cold, so it modulates the spool down to direct all the flow right back to well, – actually, it'll move through the controls – and out to the hydraulic cylinders and things like that. And if, if, you, if it's used when it's still too cold, you're going to find uh, sluggish use, a little bit um, uh, extra work for the, for the pump and everything else. Normally what will happen is it will get recirculated right back to the sump again, and as things come up to, towards temperature, now our thermal bypass, our, uh, yeah, thermal bypass valve will start modulating from sending the cold to the right to now sending it to the left up through the heat exchanger. When it goes through the heat exchanger, it comes out at the optimal temperature, let's say uh, 40C, and now the system is used. And so what, that, what the uh, key element here is that the thermal bypass valve, as shown there, 
constantly monitors it throughout the, uh, the whole process to make sure that if there's any shifts, if the, if the heat exchanger for some reason becomes a little bit too efficient and starts cooling it off a little bit more, our valve will notice, or the, a, a, a thermal bypass valve will notice that and make the um, appropriate uh, spool modulation to keep that ratio and proportion correct. Um, thermal bypass uh, valve installation. So a thermal bypass valve controls the process air temperature on nitrogen carts used for ground servicing for aircraft. And as I'm sure some of you are aware, uh, a lot of times they'll fill the tires with nitrogen instead of air uh, to, uh, to uh, prevent overheating and possible flat from the uh, uh, temperature uh, differential that you see from uh, when, when, when the plane is on the ground versus at minus 66 F at 36,000 feet. So, and the other uh, uh, really good advantage is for um, fire suppression uh, because you can, since there's no oxygen in the uh, nitrogen, obviously, it'll uh, extinguish the uh, flames without uh, compromising any other individuals in the area. And also there is no uh, uh, residual uh, uh, matter left over afterwards. Uh, another application was air, air flow control for unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, designed to control an air intake and maintain engine coolant temperatures within a specific range on aircraft. Uh, constantly monitor circulating coolant temperature and opens and closes the aircraft intake flap uh, in response to temperature variations. The benefits here are it's lightweight and compact and, of course, self-actuating. So on the picture on the left there, you have the engine coolant coming in, let's say on the line that, that's pointing to it with the little blue fitting right below it. It's coming in there, and it's, there's that, the actuator inside it is immersed in a, in a small, uh, uh, like sump, we'll say, and it goes, so it'll go down, pass through, and go through the, uh, so if, if it enters through the leading fitting, it'll go down, circulate past, and exit through the uh, following fitting right behind it on the right-hand side. And depending on the temperature of that, the actuator, if it's, if it's cold, the uh, actuator piston will then start to retract, closing off the air intake flat gap uh, to help starve the uh, uh, flow a little bit to help warm things up. And if it's, as it warms up and gets a little bit hotter than normal, then what it'll do is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it, it, as, it, as it heats up, it's going to start, uh, the actuator piston will start to extend out, opening the air intake flap, and it'll keep modulating back and forth to try and keep the optimum temperature range. As far as the avionics, electronics cooling, avionics cooling systems can rely on liquid cooling plates to dissipate excess heat. In those designs, the coolant runs through the cold plate, removing the heat and releasing it through the heat exchanger. Benefits of liquid cooling eliminates temperature spikes. It's compact, ideal for complex designs with space constraints and high thermal output. And the pump size can be optimized using a thermostatic valve. So as you can see in the picture there, uh, so you have your pump, which sends the, uh, uh, the coolant up through a manifold. And the manifold comes out and goes through each of the, indiv in, in, in each of the in individual, in this case, uh, four cold plates. So they would go in, uh, go in, uh, heat through the heat, uh, required heat transfer, and then come out, come into a collective manifold, go up through our uh, uh, thermal bypass valve, and if, it's, if what it's sensing from the output from the cold plates is too cold, it just recircs it right back to the pump. When it gets into the range of where they want it to be, where, where, where the optimal range of the uh, temperature of the equipment needs to be, it then modulates the spool, as we had said previously, and now goes up through the heat exchanger. And again, it, so it could always be somewhat open. Uh, it's, it's not an either or. And with the um, modulating bypass type valves, what they can do is they can actually control any intermediate temperatures that are not quite cold enough or not quite hot enough. But but definitely when when it's when it's in the uh, totally cold uh, scenario, it will bypass 100% to the cold. And if it's in the totally hot over the range, it'll bypass everything through the heat exchanger. Uh, and lastly, for this one, would be the galley skull protection. So this prevents uh, scalding from uh, water-bearing lines in the kitchenette and the laboratory faucet on aircraft. 
Uh, it's installed in line, skull protection valves, monitor, water temperature and automatically closed to stop flow should temperature increases and, and, and to, should the temperature increase to un, unsafe levels. The benefits are rapid response to temperature. It's compact, fits to, into pretty much any uh, pre-existing system, easy installation, and it's uh, unaffected by pressure variations. And this is one of the uh, inline examples right here where it says hat valve. And HAT stands for heat actuated trap. That's something that's a, a, a term that, that we, we use here at uh, Thermo Omega Tech. Um, so for the coffee maker, if there's an upset condition where there's a backflow, that's, so if, as you can quite imagine, uh, coffee temperature is usually up around 170, 180 degrees F. If there's ever a, a backflow condition that could possibly get to the uh, galley faucet, our, our HAT valve is in series in line with that. And when it senses anything over scolding, which would be at 120 degrees F, the valve will automatically shut down and uh, uh, refuse any, any flow past that until it uh, drops down below to um, a, a safe temperature. Right. Okay. I mean, that gives us a good idea of the, the huge range of applications uh, that they can be used for. Um, and one of the key points about this is uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of thermostatic valves uh, against solenoid valves, which is the other main type? Oh, okay. So uh, the main differences are uh, for solenoid valves, solenoid valves utilize multiple components, which rely on electric power. To operate. This usually leads to additional uh, installation expenses, increased space requirements, and potential disasters in the event of a power loss. But the thermo uh, thermostatic valves conversely uh, respond to temperature variations utilizing uh, a thermal actuator to either extend or retract the, a plug to control the system flow. So from that, the advantages of a solenoid versus thermostatic valves, or solenoid valves, hands down, the response time is in milliseconds. And also, uh, the exact temperature regulation is to within tenths of a degree F are totally possible with that. Uh, where we think the thermostatic valves sort of have a superior advantage are there's no additional components uh, for the valve control required. It's self-operating, uh, lightweight, there's no uh, wiring to, to run anywhere or anything like that, like we like we had mentioned previously, can be mounted pretty much anywhere in any orientation, up, upside down, that doesn't really matter. Uh, one of the main benefits that we find, they are explosion proof, requiring no uh, electrical power, which could cause sparking in uh, like refinery environments where there could be some type of uh, flammable gases or, or fumes around. Um, uh, they are pressure in independent, rely solely on sensing temperature, so any pressure fluctuations don't bother it at all. And it can be uh, located virtually anywhere in, in the system. Right. Um, so that's a, the advantage. Um, what sort of strict and unique requirements do you see in the aerospace and defense applications uh, for these products? Well, so uh, I think one of the most critical ones are it's a weight and space. Like I said, when we, if we go back to the uh, low swap device concept, I think that's really, that, that's really the uh, paramount critical uh, thing to, for uh, consideration. Uh, materials that are typically used with, uh, would be stainless steel, usually a 300 series, uh, non-magnetic. Um, so aluminum, usually like the 7075 aircraft type aluminum. Titanium, like uh, grade five, grade two, grade five, and the, some of the uh, more exotic metals like Monal, Inconel, and Hastoid, depending on what the corrosive environments that they would have to go into would be. Uh, another one would be uh, component traceability and serialization, uh, custom temperature range requirements, and of course, a flow rate, number of inlets, outlets, uh, added features such as a leak port, manual override, and lock wires. Okay. That's pretty much on everything Thank I you. Had. Thank you for that, Glenn. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, thanks for that. So we begin with today's Q&A.
is going to ask you to direct your attention to our webinar survey, which is available on the right of the presentation window. If you close the survey, you can reopen the widget by clicking on the clipboard icon, icon along the bottom of the screen. Thanks in advance for filling out the feedback form. Your participation in this survey will allow us to better serve you in future webinars. And now, on to the question and answer portion of the event. As a reminder, to participate in Q&A, just type your question in the text box on the left of the presentation window, or click the purple Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. If we're not able to answer all the submitted questions during today's webinar, we'll be sure to share them with our speaker, who can then reply to you offline. So, looking at the uh, questions we have here, uh, how difficult is it to make customizations to commercial off-the-shelf valves? I'm sorry, could you repeat that, David? Uh, how how difficult is it to make um, customizations to your commercial off-the-shelf valves? Okay, so yeah, so depending on the application and the, and the severity of the changes to make it customizable, um, we have gone from the, a plethora of uh, using it straight right off the shelf, pretty much, uh, to um, totally new uh, concepts. So I, I, I have to say it would vary on the degree of complexity of the um, apparatus that we've used in. Yep, so it really depends on what the actual customization is, something that uh, you're used to doing. Yeah, exactly. So what we would try and do is use anything that's Cots available off the shelf. We we'll use every every possible um, item that we have in stock that we use as stock first before having to go to any kind of um, customized solution. Uh, okay. So next question: What's the calibration and testing procedure for thermostatic valves prior to shipping? Okay. So yeah, our standard. Uh, uh, um, standard op operating procedure for that would be, um, so we would build, a, let's say we got an order in for 10 valves, what we would do is uh, the first of the 10 would, would get sent to the um, uh, temperature uh, uh, curve chamber. And what we would do is from that curve I had showed you previously with the uh, uh, hysteresis band and all that stuff, we would actually run that curve. On, on one of the thermal elements just to make sure that we, to verify that we have the correct wax blend for the, uh, for the whole lot of, of 10. So that would be the stroke curve to, to prove that we have the, uh, the adequate um, uh, active range, that, that, that we're within the active te temperature range and we have adequate stroke. From there, we would take the other nine and set up a hot bath and cold bath scenario and within it with the, um, specified applied load for the application, we would uh, put them into uh, uh, cycling fixtures and we would cycle them between the hot expanded and cold retracted bath and would ver to, to, to verify that we're getting the um, adequate stroke from that. So everything is 100% tested. Right, absolutely. Um, so as, as you showed us, these valves come in a variety of different sizes. Um, what factors are considered when determining the correct size for a thermal bypass valve? Yeah, so the main factors are going to be uh, pressure and the CV, the uh, flow coefficient of the valve. So depending on what the allowable pressure drop is across the valve, um, uh, that, that, that would be one of the big uh, determining factors. Also, um, since a lot, of, a lot of the valves use uh, uh, VG-type uh, oils and stuff like that, you know, viscosity grade, as we know, the oils are going to be um, uh, of a thicker, visco higher viscosity and, and at lower temperature, and conversely, at a, uh, a, a lower viscosity when at, at higher temperatures. So basically going from almost like a pancake syrup when it's cold it's almost like rubbing alcohol when it's hot. So depending on that, that, that would help determine uh, the actual sizing of the valve. Oh, okay. Um, so what sort of temperature operating range do you have for these valves? Currently, it's uh, around minus 25F up to plus 300F. But we're uh, continually looking to expand that. Um, especially, 
especially into the uh, lower, almost cryogenic ranges, maybe down around mi mi minus ADF or so. Right. Uh -huh. uh, can thermostatic valves be field adjusted? Uh, typically, no. And the reason for that is because sometimes we've run into errors where if people aren't totally familiar with how the valve operates and the theory behind it, uh, most, it seems like most of the inquiries and applications that we get, they're looking for just uh, something that can control within uh, that certain temperature band. If you remember, I had mentioned about the, um, uh, the, the volumetric efficiency versus the mechanical e efficiency. So there's usually like a, maybe a 10 to 20 degree F uh, optimal temperature band that you, that you want to keep that process between. Right. Um, so what sort of uh, lifetime, as in number of cycles, do you typically expect uh, out of a thermal valve? So uh, uh, from previous uh, cycle testing, we've done at least uh, 150,000 cycles. Now, uh, bear in mind, that's on the thermal element itself, and that is cycling uh, uh, 30 seconds up, 30 seconds down, continuing until the thing would, would actually die. So, uh, but the thing is, that's a, that's a very, very extreme case. Um, but for th uh, thermal bypass valves and thermal and mixing valves, they tend to sit there and dither back and forth, uh, only using it up a fraction of the full percentage of, um, of available stroke. So they tend to last a lot longer, upwards of like 10 years, I'll say. Right, so you would, for them, you'd be measuring the lifetime in years rather than in terms of the, the number of cycles that they go through because they're, they're just not used that frequently. Exactly, yes. Right. Uh, okay, so how much control is there within the phase change area, uh, asks one questioner. Uh, and they're expanding on that. That is, is there a repeatable force throughout, sorry, a repeatable force output when 40 to 50 percent of the phase change is complete? Yeah, so the force output is constant from the actuator. The force output is constant. So that one example I gave that larger actuator of 150-pound load that it, that it could push, it could push that load from fully retracted all the way up to its half-inch uh, fully stroked out uh, uh, length. Uh, and, and to say, so that force output is repeatable, that, that's consistent throughout? 100 percent, yep. Right, certainly. Um, now, you did mention that uh, the response time is longer for thermostatic valves uh, compared to electronically controlled. Uh, can you put any sort of numbers on that? Yes, definitely. So, like for the solenoid valves, we were saying they since they react within milli, uh, within pretty much um, milliseconds uh, for the uh, thermostatic uh, uh, actuators that we use. Typically around 15 seconds, I would say, depending on what the delta T is that you're going from and to. So in other words, if you're going from, let's say, 100 degrees F, and you and you hit it with a, a step response of 200 degrees F, the valve will probably, uh, re uh, the actuator will stroke all the way out probably within seven or eight seconds, maybe 10. But if you're only going from 100 degrees to 110, and it, it, it might take a little bit longer because your uh, thermal pressure, so to speak, isn't as great. So, but but in but in so in, in in general, I would say on average, I would say 15 to 30 seconds to go from fully retracted to fully extended. Again, depending on the uh, thermal pressure, so to speak, on it. Right. So obviously, it's important to match the application to something for which that's an appropriate time range. Exactly. Okay. Uh, and one, this is uh, clearly related to aviation specifically. Um, what's the maximum altitude where this type of valve can be used? Uh, so currently, the only, uh, I think the limiting factor would be more like the O-rings and things that go into the total product and everything. Uh, We've had things at 36,000 feet. We actually have things that, that go into um, satellites in, in space. So uh, it, it, it's just a matter of match. 
uh, what we have to, to whatever the uh, particular application is. Right. Uh, and then kind of related to that, uh, I guess, what's the typical range of temperatures for your waxes from full open valve position? Yeah, so like I said, uh, currently we have, we can go from about minus 20, minus 25 F up to 300 F. Right. Uh, and I guess that may very well answer the, um, sorry, the, seeing what the, the next question um, is on that, which is, uh, the aerospace industry desires better reliability than wax thermal valves can achieve. Are there other types of thermal valves with, be with um, better reliability? Uh, do you accept that question? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that with, with, uh, with, with any clarity. No, fair enough. Um, okay. And someone else saying, being a novice, but following conversations in the use of hydrogen for aircraft, I assume for fuel, do you currently That's be required in order to one? manage the pressure? Okay, so they're saying, being a novice, but following conversations in the use of hydrogen for aircraft, you currently have valves, etc., that would be required in order to manage the pressures and temperatures required to manage hydrogen as a fuel source. Is that something that you've uh, been asked to look at at all? Uh, not but not uh, hydrogen in particular. Now, helium we have been, yes, but hydrogen, with it being such a small atom, we've had, uh, again, we haven't had much... Uh, uh, exposure to that, but I know there's a lot of uh, uh, issues with, with trying to uh, being able to seal hydrogen in. So uh, I, I, I really can't uh, talk with any uh, uh, experience on that uh, particular point. But helium I can, yes. That's, that's a, that would be one that we do know of, yeah. Uh, and is that something that you're uh, actively engaged in at the moment? Uh, for, for the helium one, that's something we had done in probably yeah. four or five years ago. But for, uh, but, so since the hydrogen is highly flammable, again, that's one where you would definitely not want to use a uh, solenoid valve <laughs> or anything with that, that with any no, uh, no. Sparking, but that's, sparking I mean, I, I guess with uh, with hydrogen fuel, would they be talking about hydrogen in liquid form? So would we be looking at cryogenic type, uh, or do you oh, think okay, that yes. would be more yes. gas phase? Yes, and, and so it may be, it may be that's an, uh, another good point. Um, I'm sorry, go, David. Uh, no, go, carry on. No, I was just going to say that. Uh, so, if 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 say we had a uh, mixing or, or diverting um, or, or thermal bypass valve that's uh, meant for say 40 C, 104 F, or something like that, it's uh, as long as the uh, thermal element is outside of its temp uh, outside of its active band, and it's basically fully solid. It can see uh, somewhere down near cryogenic temperatures because it, because it, it, it would not be um, operational at that point. It would just sit there dormant. So in other words, it, it can be exposed to that, even though it wouldn't be operating at that. So in other words, it could be. It, um, exposed to like minus 66 up at uh, 36,000 feet um, but then it, you know once once the the system would warm up and it gets into its active region the, the uh, actuator and and hence the valve would, would still be able to operate fine right well it's not a challenge that you're taking on at the moment um, conceptually this is the kind of thing that could be used to handle hydrogen or other exotic type fuels that come along in future. Exactly, yes. Okay, right. I'm just looking to see whether we've got uh, any more questions in there. Have that the end of them? Um, okay. Uh, with, with, uh, Glenn, is there anything else you'd like to say to uh, before we wrap up? No, I think that's pretty much it. I, I'm not sure what else I can explain. Okay, other that's than, great. Thanks very much. Thank, I um, thank everyone for showing. Right.
Um, so before we sign off, I'd like to thank our presenter, Glenn Quinty, as well as our sponsor, Therm Omega Tech. Within the next 24 hours, you'll receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand to invite your colleagues and peers who may not have been available to listen to the event. Thank you so much for attending and have a wonderful remainder of your day. Thank you.